Hello, Blake Rudis here with part two of Adobe Camera Raw 12.3. And if you're just joining us, this series has been pulled from one of the videos in the 30 days to Photoshop mastery course, to be exact, it's day number four. So what I've done is I've taken day four and I've broken it up into four individual parts to make it a little bit easier for a uh, YouTube palette here on YouTube. If you want to see all the other parts, if you're just jumping in right now, you can go into the description below and have quick access to part one, three or four. In part two, we're only going to be discussing the basic adjustments today. Some very basic adjustments in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm going to break those things down so you're more familiar with them and know how they work for you in your work. If you like this and you're interested and you want to learn more, you can click on the card above, which will take you to the 30 Days to Photoshop Mastery course or in the description below and learn more about the 30 Days to Photoshop Mastery course. Without further ado, here is part number two to Adobe Camera Raw 12.3. So the global tools, let's start with the basic adjustments here. So these basic adjustments are going to be your white balance and any of your exposure and contrast adjustments. By default, raw files do not look good. They're not meant to look good. It's raw data. It's exactly like what happens between a raw and a JPEG is your camera wants to give you the best possible picture it can ever give you. So if you put it in JPEG mode and take a picture, it's going to look great. You take a raw file, you're like, why does this look like crap? Well, it's giving you the raw data, what it captured. So it's up to you to now manipulate that data to get it to look best. I don't shoot in JPEG. I never would shoot in JPEG. Not anymore. Not after the control that I have in raw images. And I think after today's lesson, you're going to see why too. So there used to be an auto button right here that was above the exposure. Now the auto button is over here. And you have two buttons here, black and white, which is going to change all of your settings here over to black and white, and then auto. And you can also click black and white auto. So to make an auto adjustment for your black and white image, I don't tend to do any black and white adjustments in Adobe camera raw. And that's because if you open this up in Photoshop, you lose all of the color data and the way I manipulate or edit and make black and white photos, which we'll talk about later in one of the workflow images is I use the color data that's in my image to make a better black and white photo. That's why I don't do my black and white processing in Adobe camera raw. I tend to do that in Photoshop. So you will very rarely see me push that black and white button, but I do press the auto button and I press it often. So what, I, what happens when I press the auto button is you probably saw it down here, all these settings down here changed, right? And they changed because when I press auto, it makes an assessment of the image and it makes the best possible contrast adjustment it can based off of the highlights, midtones, and shadows in the image on an algorithm that Adobe has come, that Adobe has come up with as what looks good. Okay. And you know what, honestly, that auto button works great. <laughs> it's, I use it all the time. I honestly, as an educator, I can't really set my preset to be an auto, but if I wasn't educating all the time, I would for sure set it up so that every image I brought into Photoshop automatically had the auto adjustment done in Adobe camera Raw. Why? Because it gives me a better looking photo. It's a better image that I can assess really quickly and easily. Now, when I press the auto button, you're going to notice that we have this red spot here and these blue spots here. What is that? What's that basically is telling us is that's these toggles right here. These are clipping toggles. What they tell us is that when this clipping toggle is on, we have data here that is beyond white. That's a bad thing. It's clipped so far. It's not looking good anymore. What that's telling us here is that this is data that is so far beyond black. It's not even black anymore. It's blacker than black. If that was even something that could exist in a, in a pixel. Okay. Same thing with white. Now you can't really go beyond black or beyond white because black is zero as a pixel value and white is 255. But what happens is let's say we move this black slider down here and then we turn this off, this little clipping warning off over here. You see how we have these really inky black spots that toggle right there is actually telling us, Hey, you might want to fix that. So the way we do that is just pull this over to the right and pull away the black so that we don't have anything clipping there or going beyond black. Same thing with white. When this is way up here, it's saying, Hey, you have this way overexposed to the point that this is data that doesn't exist anymore. So we want to pull this down until that doesn't happen. There's another way to do this. You can turn these off. If you don't want these on, if you think they're a distraction, you can turn them off. But the other way to do this is if you alt or option click and then click on the white, it's going to turn your image black and white. Okay. And then as you move it over, it's saying, Hey, you're starting to clip here. If it's white, you're clipping in all of the channels, the blue channel, the red channel, and the green channel. But now you see how it just shows blue. That means we're clipping in the blue channel. Move this over. You might see we're clipping some of the yellows as well. 
and then moving into the cyans and such there too. So alt or option will show you exactly which channel you're clipping in, whereas these toggles up here just show you that you're clipping in general. It's a good idea to keep them on so that as you're editing, you know how to fix your photo. So let's talk about these individual sliders. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna reset this. If you wanna reset any one of these tabs at any given time, press alt or option, and it's gonna say reset. Now, if you reset down here, it's gonna reset everything you did. If you just alt or option click, and you can just reset an individual area. Okay, so I'm gonna reset that. Alt or option, press and hold, and then once you release it, it doesn't say reset anymore. So I'm gonna go back in here and kind of show you how this works. Typically, the way my workflow works with these is I increase the exposure to brighten the image or decrease it depending on what it needs. This image is very dark. So I'm gonna increase it by about one stop. Now I can either move this over or I can actually just type one and press enter and it moves it up one whole stop of light. I then tend to go down to my whites and darks to see if I can get more white point or more black point out of my image. And then I will go into my highlights and my shadows. So I can move my, my highlights down to get more detail in that sky and move my shadows up to get more brightness in the overall area of my photo. Now, everything you do in Adobe Camera Roll and everything you see me do in my editing process is a slow buildup process, okay? I don't try to go too fast. Um, I'm slowly building up. So what I do here, I'm gonna build up very slowly. And then as I get into um, you know, Photoshop, it's gonna be a slow buildup as well. Then after I've done my exposure, my highlights, my shadows, my whites, my blacks, I then go into the contrast. Now, what I want you to realize here is that all of this is doing something to this thing up here. And this looks like scary data, but you know what? This is what's called your histogram. This is telling us that, and it even says blacks. This is the darkest dark areas in my image. If I move this over, that's the shadow areas in my image. If I move this to the middle, that's my midtones. If I move this right here, that's my highlights and that's my whites. It even tells us now on this histogram that if you move this slider, the black slider, it's gonna affect this area of the histogram. If we move the shadows, it's gonna affect this area of the histogram. If we move the exposure, it's basically gonna be the middle area of the histogram and the highlights and the whites. So how that works in practical application, alt or option, I'm gonna reset this again, looking specifically at the histogram. So if I look at this histogram, it clearly needs to be brightened up. So I'm gonna move this over. As I move this over, look what happens. It grabs the whole histogram and moves it all the way over to the right. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get data to fill in here. I don't have any data in these white areas. So I'm gonna move this over until I start to get some data in those white areas. You see how that works, okay? Right about at one, at plus one is about where I should be for that anyway. Now, my white point, if I move this up, it's gonna pull that tone curve, it's gonna pull that histogram more closer in a finite way over to the side. So you use exposure to dial in the initial setting, then you use your whites and your blacks to get it closer and make finite changes. You see how that works? Then if you want even more finite changes, we can move our highlights and it just grabs that histogram right in that highlight area and moves it to the left more towards the midtones or to the right more towards the brightest bright areas. Moving it more towards the midtones is gonna give us more dynamic range in this image, making that background actually look a lot better. Same thing with the shadows. We move it to the left, it's gonna pull your shadows closer to your black points. Move it to the right, it's gonna pull your shadows more closer to your midtones. So it's fine tune editing. It starts with exposure, then goes down to the whites and the blacks, then highlights and shadows, and then I start working on my contrast to dial that in. You see what that contrast does is after we've manipulated the midtones, we're gonna need to do something to kind of spread it out to create depth because we lost depth in this expansion of dynamic range. So as I move this contrast over, look what happens. Oh man, that looks so much better because what's it doing to the histogram? It's grabbing those midtones and saying, okay, I'm gonna polish you guys off a little bit. I'm gonna force the brightest bright areas over into, um, force the midtones that are in the bright area towards the brights, force the midtones into the dark area towards the darks to make it an overall more appealing image, creating more depth in the photograph, okay? Looking really good here. Now, these settings right here are gonna be your white balance. Now, white balance can be tricky at first, okay? I'm gonna be the first one to admit that these white balance sliders scared the junk out of me before. But really what it is, is it's just a way to blend color within your image. Now, I used to just use these settings in here, which are basically predefined settings. Auto white balance doesn't look that great. Daylight might look all right. This is a daylight image. Um, doesn't look that great as a shade setting or even tungsten or flash or whatever, but I tend to just stay with that shot. And then I look at the image and say, you know what? This looks like it could need a little bit more yellow because the yellows aren't quite where they need to be and maybe a little bit more green, okay? And this gives me a way that I can really fine tune my white balance. Now, there is a way that you can select 
a, a white point or a middle gray point to be what sets up your white balance. And that's this little eyedropper over here. Now, if you just click the eyedropper and then move over here and just click, that's gonna say that this point, hey, that point that I just clicked there, that is gonna be what we call gray, okay? And because we're telling that Adobe Camera Roll that's gray, it's gonna take your white balance and it's gonna try to make it look as best so that, that becomes 128, 128, 128 gray. Now you can try to get a color sample off of that by going to your sampler over here using a new sample. We're gonna click over here and maybe click right here. That's gonna give us 206, 206, 207. So it's not quite 128. Trying to find 128 gray on this image could be very difficult. That is gonna be more closer to our white areas. So even these points here, we might get kind of close to a 128, but we're not quite sure. So what you can do is with this white balance dropper here, is you can actually click and drag and say, you know what, take an assessment of that gray cloud and that white cloud, kind of mix them together and make that the basis of the white balance for the photograph. And that works really well. Again, that's just a click and drag to get a good white balance there, okay? Typically what I'll do there is I'll try to find pixels that are white or gray that I know to be white or gray or look similar to white and gray and grab a batch of them. Now, if I were to grab this area right here, you see what that's gonna do there? It's gonna say, hey, we're telling this area to become gray. So what does it have to do? It has to offset all the temperature in the image to make this look gray. That's why we did that off of the clouds because that's probably more of an accurate representation. Now you can actually click and drag from the top of this image all the way down to the bottom right and make the entire image an auto white balance assessment. But that would be very similar to just pressing the auto white balance, okay? so. What I think is really best for white balance at the very beginning of things is just grab a batch of things that you look to be gray and white and grab a batch of pixels, not just one individual pixel, okay? So what you're also gonna see here going down, moving down towards the bottom here, you have the texture and the clarity. Now, if you move texture up, it's gonna give your image more texture. This is great for rocks, even with the path down here. But this is a global setting, not good. It makes everything look really crunchy, like granola bar. It's not good, okay? So I'm gonna move that down. If I move it down, it's gonna soften the texture. What this works best as is actually in a local tool and not in a global tool. C Clarity, on the other hand, can give us an overall slight boost in contrast in the micro contrast areas. If we look at the histogram, this isn't taking the, the, like the contrast slider up here where it grabs this and just flattens it down. This is grabbing individual areas here and it's, it's kind of forcing them all together to make a cluster of histogram data kind of pull together, taking the areas of high contrast to low contrast and forcing them to kind of fuse together to create a more clearer picture or more clarity with more detail. Now I say use clarity sparingly, a slight moderate bump is okay, but if you use too much, it could look like over-processed HDR photography. So little bump in clarity isn't a bad idea. Dehaze. Dehaze is great. Let's say you're standing on the top of a mountain and you're shooting to another mountain. There's a lot of atmospheric haze between you and that other mountain. Dehaze can actually be used to cut a lot of that hazy data. If we move this over, what you're gonna see is that it's gonna be adding a lot of blue while it does that. So if you're gonna use dehaze, you might wanna use that in conjunction with your temperature slider to offset the amount of blue coming in by moving it more towards the yellow. Dehaze is something that I use very sparingly as well. And typically I'll use dehaze more as a local adjustment and not an overall global adjustment for the whole photo. Again, every photo is different, but be careful with dehaze. You move it down, it makes your photo more hazy, okay? So if you have a foggy photo, that could be good to add some drama to that image by moving that down. Vibrance is gonna be an overall boost in color while trying to uh, protect your skin tone areas for portrait work. Now landscape work, you can see it's all the colors around the color orange here are moving up faster than the other ones. Uh, vibrance is a better adjustment to use to increase your colors than saturation as a whole. I typically don't increase saturation as a whole right here. I'm gonna show you that when we get to the color mixer, okay? So vibrance, just give it a small bump if you're gonna give it a bump at all. Uh, it does, typically will not need too much of a bump here in that basic setting. So I'm gonna close this down. You'll see this little eyeball here. That tells us that we've done something in the basic setting. This little dot here tells us that we've done something in our basic or global adjustments. If you click and hold on that preview, it will temporarily turn it off. Release it, turns it back on. 
Thanks for watching this part of the 30 Days to Photoshop Mastery course. If you like this, there is plenty more in the 30 Days to Photoshop Mastery course. You can find that in the card above and in the link below. And if you want to watch the other parts to this little mini series that I've pulled from the 30 Days to Photoshop Mastery course, you can look in the description below and navigate to each individual part for quick access. I do hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot from it, and I hope it made the new Adobe Camera Raw a little bit easier for you. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. I sincerely appreciate it.